morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to services this morning as we enter into our last hour of worship. We are so thankful and grateful for each and every one of you being here. You uh, certainly have encouraged me, and I know uh, others have been encouraged as well. We're so thankful for the, the songs that have been led and the prayers that have been offered up this morning and uh, uh, for the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. Just a, a glorious morning that we're so thankful for to be able to do this on the first day of the week. If you're here visiting with us, we want you to know that you are our honored guest. And if you have any questions, please stick around. Let us, let us get to know you and, and ask us any questions that you might have as we strive to do all that we can to serve God in spirit and in truth. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter, Acts chapter two we have... The day of Pentecost, and if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles over there, we will be uh, studying from that text this morning. But on the day of Pentecost, we have the first recorded gospel sermon here with, with Peter, and we know that, that he and, and others were, were preaching here on, on this day, but I want to notice some points that we have here from Acts chapter 2. Peter really starting off after he and the others were... Uh, accused of, of being drunk, he, he, he goes through and, and gives a defense and even goes to, to Joel, goes back to the Old Testament and says, hey, what was prophesied back there, that, that this is that, that this is that day, and, 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 and it is here. And, and then he goes on to preach his sermon, talking about Jesus, the fact that he proved himself through his miracles. And then he went to other Old Testament passages proving that Jesus is the Christ, and that's where we get to the conclusion, or the, 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 the conclusion he comes to at the climax of his sermon in verse 36, whenever he says, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That Jesus that Peter had been talking about, that he said had proved himself by the miracles that who he was, and that the Old Testament prophets and, 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 and all these things were pointing to, that one who you crucified, the Jesus who you crucified, is both Lord and Christ. Verse 37, we see the reaction of the crowd. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter answered, or Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off and as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this, this perverse, perverse generation. Verse 40 is the verse that I want us to look at and I want us to narrow in on and look at whenever we think about this sermon that is preached. You know, the, the American Standard ver Version and the English Standard Version and others render verse 40 a little bit differently than be saved, they say in verse 40. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. I believe that that is an accurate translation, translation in what is being pointed out here in verse 40. Many other words. He continued to preach after making that point, and he, he continued to say these things, but all of it was surrounded this. And his plea, what he was talking about, what he, what, what he was saying is, you need to save yourselves from this perverse, this perverse generation. And there's a reason why he makes that statement. And really, whenever we look at the sermon as a whole, while he, he backs it up with evidences of, of who Jesus is and all these types of things, his sermon really kind of has three main points, three main things that he's trying to point out. One, your condition in the world. And as a result of your condition in the world, you, you need to understand that there's an opportunity for salvation, and then there's a plea to save yourselves from this perverse generation. And that is what we are going to look at this morning. You know, to understand the fact that, that, that there is this plea to save ourselves from this Perverse generation, we need to understand what that is. Why, why do we need to save ourselves from this perverse generation is really what we're getting at. What we need to understand and what we need to realize is that we are in need in salvation of this 
perverse generation. You know, this generation, th- th- this idea, this perverse generation is a crooked and curved, bent. One that is not submitting to, one that is not following God's word. And the reality is that we live in a world that has made the decision to rebel against God. We see that all around. We were talking in Bible class here in the auditorium. Whenever we were going through some various things, Aaron pointed out this month the fact that this is Pride Month. And we see the immorality and all the, the, the different things that go along with it that, 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 that happen in this world. We no doubt are living in a world that has rebelled against God, a world that has made the choice to not keep His commandments. That's the idea. You need to be saved from that. Why? Well, because you are a part of it. You are in that. And what we need to understand and recognize with that is, is not that we are a part of that generation. It's, it's not just because we live here and are in it, but because we made the choice to be a part of that. In other words, we made the choice just like this, perverse generation, just like this crooked or curved or bent generation, this generation that is not following God, just like it has not made that choice, we have not made that choice as well. You know, as a result of this crookedness, of being perverse, not doing what God has said, we understand that whenever one is disobedient to God, that there will be punishment and destruction as a result of that. That's what's talked about in Colossians chapter 3, Verse 6, one of the things that, that, that Paul is writing to them is, hey, you need to set your mind on things above. If, if you have truly been one that has come out of this world, that, that, that has been saved and come out of this world, you need to make sure that you are no longer going back in it. You need to make sure you're no longer living the way that you were. Why? Because verse 6, <clears throat> he says, on account of these, these things, the wickedness of this world, the, the, the perversion of this world, he says, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked. So we understand that the wrath is coming. The wrath of God is coming. Who's it coming upon? It's coming upon sons of disobedience. It's coming upon those who are disobedient. We need to understand that. We need to recognize that. That there will be punish that's com- punishment that's coming for those who are disobedient to God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7-10. through 10. We read, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the, and from the glory of His power. Destruction is ultimately going to come upon all. In what form and in what way? An eternal destruction. And that's not an eternal, complete wiping away from existence as someone to believe. But that is a casting down into hellfire eternal. So we understand the destruction is going to come. Well, who's it going to come upon? It's going to come upon those who disobey God. No doubt this perverse generation is that who disobeys God, they're, they're crooked, they're, they're bent, they're, they're not following the ways of God, they're doing it whatever it is they want to do. What we understand and what we recognize from Scripture is that all have done that. And we also need to say, see and notice that this is not a foreign concept. We, whenever we were going through Jude in the auditorium and in the high school class, we noticed this from Jude, verses 5 through 7. But I want to remind you, Though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their abode. He has, <clears throat> he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for, for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner, these having given themselves over to sexual morality and having gone afar uh, gone, gone after strange things as set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What do we recognize from this? What we recognize is no matter who or what you are, whether you are God's children, or children of Israel, you're the angels, or you're in Sodom and Gomorrah, if you're one who is disobedient to God, if you're one that rebels against God, you are one that is going to suffer punishment. So we notice that, we see that, we recognize that. That is no doubt what this perverse generation is doing. It's no doubt what this world is doing. But we need to understand and recognize that all have put themselves into this position. 
See, a lot of times we do go down the path of thinking, like, well, at least I'm not like so-and-so. At least I'm not uh, doing that or committing that act. I'm not that caught up into sin. What I want us to realize is that when we read Romans 3, 23, what we recognize is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's one of the points that Paul's making whenever he's writing this letter to the Romans. He's pointing out the fact that Jew and Gentile alike have sinned and separated themselves from God. And Jew and Gentile alike are in need of salvation. It doesn't matter who you are. You have made that choice to sin against God. And it is a choice. It is a choice that we make. And I want us to have a proper understanding of what sin is. And there's a reason why I believe we need to highlight, underline, know where this scripture is, and understand it in relation to sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Like Harry was talking about this morning, a little bit of background to the book with the Gnostics. They believed that, 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 that uh, you can't help but to sin. It, 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 was, it was kind of a form of, a, of Calvinism, an early version of Calvinism, really. The, the idea that I can't help but to sin, the, the, the flesh is inherently sinful, and so all I'm going to do is sin, so it's really not that big of a deal and one of the things that he's pointing out in the book and in the letter is no sin is a big deal because of what sin does it causes you to be separated from God and one of the things that he points out in the book is what sin is and I believe we need to properly understand what it is sin is lawlessness in other words what sin is is sin is that which is not according to law sin is that which is going against the law or the word of God And all have made the choice to do something not according to God's word. And it's important that we understand that that's what sin is. And I say that because sometimes we get going down the path and we try to define what sin is. Or a man does from time to time. They say, well, that's sin, man. That's real sinful. And then they'll have something over here and they'll say, well, that's really not sinful. What is sin? We don't define what sin is. God defines what sin is. Because sin is what? Sin is lawlessness. Sin is doing that which is not according to to God's word. Whenever you do something that is not according to God's word, that is lawlessness, that is sin. It's not whatever we come up with it to be. Our condition is the fact that we have made the choice to do that which is against God's word. And it's important that we keep it there. And we understand that on so many for, for so many different reasons whenever we're talking to others or or studying with others or we're dealing with with brothers and sisters in Christ, or or whatever the case may be. One might say, well, is that sin or is it not? Keep it simple. Sin is lawlessness. Go to God's word and point out. If it's sinful, then you're going to be able to find why it's sinful from God's word. Sin is not keeping the law that God has given. And so we need to keep it there. And we need to understand that we have all made that choice and that decision to do that which is against God's word, not according to God's word. And whenever we do that, we put ourselves in a situation where we are separated from God. All have made this choice to do something that's not according to God's word. And whenever we do that, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us that we separate ourselves from God. It's our iniquities, our sins, that that which we do, which is lawlessness against God's word that separates us from God. We know that sin, what does it bring about? It brings about death. You remember the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. Verse 21, whenever he has those that say, Lord, Lord, have we not done these many good things in your name? What does he conclude there? The conclusion of all that is he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You who do what? Practice lawlessness. In other words, depart from me, I do not know you, you who practice sin. That's what they are doing. They are practicing that which is contrary to God's word. No matter how hard we try to say that we are living right or that we are doing right, if you are doing that which is against God's law, you are not keeping God's commands, you are committing sin. What does sin do? Sin separates you from God. And you need to understand that that's the position that you are in if you are in your sin, that that whenever you sin, you separate yourself from God and you bring about death. You bring about a situation where you have no hope. You have to have an opportunity to to come back into right relationship with God. Why? Well, because where you put yourself as a result of sin, 
is separated from God. And again, going back to Romans 3.23, all have made this choice. This isn't something where, uh, one, where it's, it's a, uh, uh, a situation where um, I, I inherited somebody else's sin. It's not a situation where uh, I just I was sinful from birth or anything like that. I have made the choice to do that, which is not according to God's law. Whenever I do that, I sin and I separate myself from him. And so I put myself in that position. That's where we are. And that's what Peter is saying in the sermon. We are in a situation, we are in a circumstance where we have sinned, you have sinned, you have separated yourself from God. And so then we need to recognize, well, is there an opportunity then for me? Because what you're saying then is I have no hope, or I am, I I am lost, and I cannot be made right. Is there a way for me to be made right? And there is an opportunity for salvation. That's why Peter concludes, save yourself from this perverse generation because there is a way to save yourself. There's a way to get out of that sin. There's a way to be forgiven, but we need to recognize what that is. Backing up into Acts uh, 2, uh, in Acts 2, backing up to verse 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know that surely that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus is that one that was prophesied about. That was going to come. And he gets in verse 38 and says that through this Jesus, who is both Lord and Christ, who has been raised from the dead, who is sitting at the right hand of God, through him there is remission of sins. What's the problem or issue? My condition is the fact that I've committed sin. I've committed that which is not according to God's law. So how do I fix that problem? Is there anything that that I need to do or is there any way to fix this problem? Peter says that it's through Jesus that there is remission of sins. Through Jesus, those sins can be removed. But see, then then we start to ask ourselves, well, how is that? I understand it's through Jesus, but how is it that Jesus removes those sins? How is it through Jesus that I have remission of sins? We recognize throughout Scripture that Jesus became the perfect sacrifice. So we recognize our condition and where we are. We need that hope. Or we we, we need that opportunity to be made right. How is that done? Well, it's through Jesus. But how? Because Jesus became the perfect sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10 really lays this out for us. Starting in verse 4, Hebrews chapter 10, we read, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Going back and comparing the old law So now the new law, that's what the book of Hebrews is about. No longer being those who are continuing in the old law because there is a new and better way in the new law, in the new covenant. One of the things that's pointed out here by the Hebrew writer is, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. The blood of bulls and goats in the Old Testament could not resolve the sin issue. All they did was merely point out the problem. Skipping down to verse 10. We, we, uh, let's back up into verse 9. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The blood of Jesus, the body of Jesus is that one, that offering that sanctifies us, that purifies us. Once for all, we no longer need that sacrificial blood of bulls and goats all the time like they had in the Old Testament. The blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice that he was, one can be made right with him. Starting in verse 14 and going through 22. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are able, or those who are being sanctified. By the Holy Spirit also, uh, but the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us after he had said before, This is a covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is is remission of these, uh, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, the conclusion of that, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
What we recognize from Hebrews chapter 10 and from what we read is this. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for us. He lived the perfect life and became the perfect sacrifice. And this was the will of God. This goes back to the beginning of Genesis. This is what everything was pointing to in the Old Testament after man's sin. Was towards Jesus being that perfect sacrifice. And through Jesus and Jesus' blood and his sacrifice, not only, can be we, not only can we be made right, but we can have assurance of salvation. We can have boldness. Why? Because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. And we need to recognize this. We need to understand this. We need to know that we do not have to doubt whether the sacrifice of Jesus will really save one. Is the sacrifice of Jesus enough? Is the blood of Jesus enough to cleanse me of my sins? Can I be made right? Hebrews says you can. Scriptures and the Bible says you can. So there is an opportunity of salvation, but one still might wonder, okay, understand that Jesus was that perfect sacrifice, but still, is there more to it? Why does the perfect sacrifice of Jesus give me that hope? How? Scripture gives us a little bit more detail when we look at that. We see that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, and that he became the propitiation for our sins. We notice this in 1 John chapter 4. Harry read from it this morning whenever he, we were recognizing what true love is and the love of God and, and what was done on our behalf and the fact that he loved us first. But I want us to recognize something that was in that text and that is in that text showing us how the sacrifice of Jesus can make us right. We read, starting in verse 9, And this the love of God was manifest toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. It's through Jesus that we can live. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but He loved us, uh, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Whenever, Je whenever God sent Jesus to become that sacrifice, and Jesus was sacrificed on our behalf, what he did is he, and what he became was that propitiation for our sins. And that word, that idea of propitiation, is the idea of appeasement. In other words, that sacrifice appeases our sins. Jesus' sacrifice appeases it. It makes it right. It can make us right. This is what the sacrifice of Jesus did. It appeased it. It, it. it is the propitiation for our sins. But not only that, we also recognize and see that through the blood of Jesus, there is redemption. Through the blood of Jesus, there is redemption. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, we read, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition, uh, by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of the lamb, as of a lamb without, uh, without blemish and without spot. So what were we uh, bought with? We were bought with that precious blood of the lamb. And this is what we were redeemed by. This is what we were redeemed with, that precious blood. Not the corruptible things of this world, but with the blood of the lamb. And what we need to understand and recognize is what redeemed means. That means to release on receipt of ransom, to free by paying ransom. What we recognize is this. While we made the choice to sin and we separated ourselves from God and, and we are in that spot, we are in that situation, what the blood of Jesus does is it offers us that opportunity for redemption. It releases us from that. It pays that ransom for that sin. It is a payment made on behalf of where we are. And so whenever we recognize all this, what we see is this. Jesus states in John 15, 5. John chapter 15, verse 5, that without me, you can do nothing. What we recognize is this. There is an opportunity of salvation, but it is not within ourselves. You have no ability, no capability, no way to pay the debt of sin. You have no way to make your sin right in of yourself. The only thing that can do that is the sacrifice in the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus that brings about redemption. It is the blood of Jesus that is the propitiation of our sins. It is through that that we can be made right. It's because he was the perfect sacrifice. 
There is nothing that I can do in of myself to obtain salvation. No amount of merit, no amount of work, nothing in that sense and in that way that I can do to make myself right with God, to make right the sin that I have committed. The only thing that provides that opportunity is Jesus and through his blood. And so with that in mind, that is why Peter concludes with, save yourselves. How does that work, right? How does that work? I understand that I'm the one that sinned and separated myself from God, and that the blood of Jesus provides me the opportunity, but how do I then save myself? How how can I save myself? And did Jesus mean it's not me? I can't do things. It's not based on your merit. It's not based on those types of things. There's There's no amount of law keeping or good deeds that you can do to earn your salvation back. You need to save yourselves by what? By being obedient to that gospel message. Peter tells them how to save themselves. It's not the fact that you sit there and do nothing. But as Peter said in verse 38, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. So what we recognize is this. What we recognize is, first, I need to repent. How do I save myself? Well, what I need to do is I need to repent. I need to change my mind. I need to change my way of thinking. The fact that I was initially thinking and doing that which is lawlessness, that which was without law, that I can no longer do. I need to repent of that. You know, the thing about repentance is that's not just a mirror of saying, hey, I repent of that, and then continuing to do whatever it is that you were doing. That's not repentance at all. Repentance is to change one's mind, to change your mind from what you were doing to something else. What are we to repent of? We're to repent of our sins. We're to repent of that wickedness. We're to change ourselves, change our mind for no longer doing that, which is lawlessness, that which is against God's word, but to now doing that which is according to God's word. I need to repent of that. I need to change my mind. Similar language as far as repentance and conversion is used over in Acts chapter 3. Very next chapter, as Peter and John are working and preaching there, he tells them, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. How are my sins going to be blotted out whenever I repent and am converted, whenever I change my mind and I'm no longer doing those things. You know, we have an example of this in Scripture. One who was out believing and sincere in what they were doing. Paul thought he was doing what was right. Going around, persecuting Christians, persecuting those of the way. He was doing that which was proper and right in the Jewish system in his eyes. But what's pointed out to Paul, what we see in Acts chapter 9, is that he was wrong. And what we see is somebody true repentance. One that went from persecuting Christians to humbly saying, what do you want me to do? You see, in order to save myself, that is what, what, what is implied from this is there is something that I must do. It's not that I sit back and do nothing and that I'm going to be forgiven of these sins. What I must do is act properly. I must do what God's word tells me to do. I need to change my way of thinking from the way that I was thinking to thinking the way God wants me to think, to doing God's will. That's exactly what Paul did. Paul went from being one who thought he was doing what was right. He even says a little bit later in Acts, I did all all things in good conscience. I did what I thought was right. That doesn't mean that he was right. He was wrong. What he did is he humbled himself and asked, what do you want me to do? He submitted himself to God's word, and he no longer was persecuting Christians. and He no longer was living as... A Jew, he was now living for Christ. He was now doing the will of Christ, as he says in Galatians. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, this is what we need to do. We need to save ourselves. Well, Peter tells them, this is how you save yourself. You repent, you change your mind, and you start doing the will of God. But he doesn't stop there. He tells them, and be baptized. What that means is to be immersed. Immerse in water. We see that throughout Scripture. And I want us to recognize something because a lot of people get to this point and are like, okay, I understand, yeah, we need to repent. There are very few that are going to deny the fact that you need to repent. But Peter tells them that they need to repent and be, be, be baptized, and this is how you save yourself from this perverse generation. 
what does that idea of baptism have to do with salvation? Why is baptism linked to salvation? Well, 1 Peter chapter 3 points out pretty clearly the baptism is now what saves. It says in verse 21, there's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. He's comparing that to those who were saved in the flood, those being obedient to God. And in, in, in their obedience, they were saved. And he gets here in verse 21, there is also an antitype which now saves us. What's going to save us? That being baptism. And he goes on and makes a statement in parentheses here. He says it's not the removal of the filth of the flesh, the answer of a good conscience toward God. In other words, it's not about just getting wet. It's not just getting in the water that's going to cleanse you. What's going to cleanse you is being obedient to God. It's not just about removing the filth of the flesh, but what you end up doing whenever you do this is you answer, uh, but, but you have an answer of a good conscience toward God. A more accurate translation of that word answer is appeal. In other words, in baptism we make an appeal toward God for a good conscience. And I want you to look over in Hebrews chapter 3, or sorry, Hebrews chapter 9. Because we have similar language over here that helps us understand how baptism is what saves. How baptism is what brings about salvation. How baptism can remove and does remove the sins that one has committed. We read over here in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 14. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Recognize what he's saying there. What happens whenever the blood of Christ is applied? He starts off in verse 13 talking about the ceremonial cleansing that was there. But that's not what we're concerned with. We're not concerned with ceremonial cleansing, and we're, we're no longer under that old law or that old system. What we have is a new and better way. What way is that? The blood of Jesus, which does what? The blood of Jesus is that which cleanses my conscience. That blood of Jesus it is, is, is that which, whenever applied, what happens? I now have a good, clean conscience towards God. I no longer have that guilt of sin. And so we recognize that, but pay attention closely to the connection that's being made. We read in Hebrews chapter 9, 13, and 14 that we make that appeal to the blood of Christ, and that cleanses our good conscience. But back in 1 Peter chapter 3, 21, when is that appeal made? That appeal is made whenever you are baptized, not beforehand. You make that appeal to be cleansed of your sins, to have that blood applied when? At baptism. Not before. So it is at baptism that what happens? It is baptism that you have the propitiation of your sins. It is at baptism that you have the redeeming blood, the exchange being made. It is at baptism that that perfect sacrifice comes into effect and that that blood is applied and you can now be cleansed of your sins. And it is at that point that you can now be assured Scripture is clear on the issue regarding baptism, and the Scripture is clear, and Peter is clear in Acts chapter 2, of what, 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 one must do, what, what one must do to be saved. What one must do is repent, change their mind, to no longer walk in that way, in that line of thinking, no longer committing lawlessness, but now doing the will of God, living for Him, and then being baptized for the remission of sins is at that point that the blood of Jesus is applied. And it is that, and then, when you will save yourself. It's not a situation where I save myself in of myself, that I did anything by merit or good works, or did some awesome thing out there in order to be able to save myself. All we do is simply submit to the command that is there to save yourself from this perverse generation. No longer be living like this perverse generation. Repent of it and turn from it and be baptized for the remission of sins. This is the plea that Peter is giving. But I want you to understand something else that is implied by this statement, save yourselves from this perverse generation, is the fact that you no longer continue to be a part of this perverse generation. In other words, it's not once you're baptized, you're saved for all time. Once you are baptized, you are forgiven of the sins 
that you have repented of and that you have committed up to that point, that you are changing your mind away from and you are now going to be living for God. But you've got to continue to stay out of that perverse generation because it's that crooked and perverse generation that the wrath of God is coming upon. So you can no longer continue in those sins. You can no longer continue to live that way. It's not a once saved, always saved type idea. What it is is a changing of one's mind, being baptized, and now living for him. But we recognize that we are man. We are men. That sometimes we fall short and that that is an opportunity even after baptism. So what happens? What, what, what if I end up back in this perverse generation? What if I end up making those same choices and those same decisions and thinking that way and, and committing sin, doing that which is not according to the law of God, committing lawlessness as I was before? We read pretty clearly in Scripture what we are to do. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Recognize the condition there, a pretty big condition laid out there. If we confess our sins, this is written to those who are already Christians. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So, When again is that blood of Jesus applied? It's applied whenever we confess them. We have a good example of this whenever we look at Acts chapter 8. Red Bulls did a great job on Wednesday night going through this section of Scripture and and giving us the invitation. And what's clearly pointed out here is an individual in Simon the Sorcerer, one who had been baptized, one who had repented and changed, but clearly had gone back into the ways, was no longer living like he should, what did, did not stay on that path, did not clearly change his, his way of thinking and not commit lawlessness, but went back to it. And what is said by Peter, he tells him that he needs to repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Peter told Simon the sorcerer he needed to repent. So what if I go back into this perverse generation? I want to stay out of it. What if I end up back in it? You repent of it. That's it. You repent it. Repent of it. It's at that point that you're going to be forgiven of your sins. Understand the fact that you can be and that you will be. The call or the plea of Peter, what Peter says is the same plea that we have this morning. And will you, as Peter said, save yourself this day? Will you save yourself from this perverse generation? How? By no longer doing the will of this perverse generation, no longer doing the will of this world, but doing the will of God understanding that your condition is separated from God. You are separated from God by your lawlessness, by the sins you have committed. The opportunity of salvation is made possible by the blood of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus only. And the plea that Peter gives is the same plea we have for you this morning. Save yourselves through repentance, baptism, and a continued walk with God. Will you do that this day? Will you save yourselves, save yourself, making yourself right? Again, not by any means of merit, not by anything that you do, but by being obedient to God, by listening to what he says and doing what he says. We hope that you will respond if you have any need this morning, whether you are one who has not been baptized. If you haven't been, you can make that right this morning. But if you are one who has been, You've gone back into this perverse generation. You can make your life right as well. If we can help you out in any way, we ask you to come as we stand and sing the song.